Hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you uh, for joining our discussion today. Um, we're not gonna do long introductions because we wanna get straight to the discussion of the movement, um, but I'm Dana Johnson and I'm happy to be in discussion with um, Ishmael Reed, Douglas Manuel and Danzy Senna. Okay, so I thought I would start with George Floyd because this is why we're here today. Yesterday he was memorialized and uh, laid to rest and he, uh, his death, his murder by the police is in a long line of murders um, intertwined with policing in this country since 1619 when the first slaves came to the colonies. Um, so we've got this violence in America and violence against blacks that is um, intertwined with our history. And, but this time it feels different. We have seen a huge outpouring of, uh, of outrage and anger and passion protests. And so I guess I wanna ask you guys, um, you know, coming on the heels of Ahmaud Arbery's murder in Georgia and Breonna Taylor's murder uh, in Kentucky, today would have been her 27th birthday. Um, does today this movement feel different? And if so, why? Why um, has this movement and these murders felt different um, this time around? And I should say that before the protests, um, George Floyd's murderers were not going to get prosecuted in any way, they were fired, but it was only after people took to the streets en masse that change has occurred. So I just wanna just get your thoughts on what has brought us to this moment today. Who yeah. wants to start? You had, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you had interracial alliances uh, in the 1960s. Uh, whites were very supportive of uh, black prog uh, progress and advancement, and they were crushed by the government. And I think we're seeing the same thing where we have a president who is, uh, wants to use uh, law enforcement to answer the problem. Right, exactly. There's similarity that you have an interracial alliance here, uh, Native Americans, Hispanics in the 1960s, and it was crushed by COINTELPRO, by the government. Right. And that's what's happening again. Danzi, you were about to say something about this. Yeah, I mean, I think, and this has been happening since, I've been thinking a lot about 1992 and the LA uprising and Rodney King and the sort of shock, I think, to some people when they first saw police brutality Though for others of us, it was not a shock, but it was evidence of what other people had already known. And so there was this visual objective um, document of what was had been happening and what people had been talking about. But I think there was a kind of level of, of uh, not listening. And so we keep seeing these things being recorded and that's becoming increasingly um, the cell phone as like a sort of... <sighs> A transgressive device that is there to kind of make things evident, to make things manifest to a wider group of people. Um, but I think that what's interesting to me, and I think this speaks to what Ishmael is saying, is that it doesn't feel in some ways different, but the response feels a little bit different. And that I think that may have to do the fact of all of these young um people of all races coming out of their houses and it's in the midst of a pandemic and um, mm -hmm. all coming together. There's a kind of collective rage. And I think it's, it's a, uh, it feels different from all of the other instances because the killing of George Floyd comes, as you've said, is a, is a long tradition in this country mm -hmm. and it is nothing new, but there's something about this particular moment and all of these things kind of coalescing 
that has added to the, I think, the larger interracial um, rage at this moment toward this suppressive government. Do you think that, you know, we've seen, we saw several instances take place, things were recorded. And so we were all in our home sort of, you know, held prisoner by the pandemic. And so we're sitting in front of our TVs watching the news. And so day after day, it seemed like in quick succession, we were getting uh, footage of police brutality. Um, so do you think that that had something to do with it too, the, the idea that we were all sort of captive audiences in this one particular moment with these images coming in um, day after day. Well, you know, speaking of the LA riots, the typical rioter, according to the Rand Corporation, was a Latinx. It's mm -hmm. not a riot exclusively. Right. What we forget, the black people, young black people like Black Lives Matter, they're aud audacious. They speak up, they're bold, and they're camera friendly. friendly. They mm -hmm. kill authentic people too. They have demonstrations out here in California against police brutality, where the police kill uh, authentic people. As a matter of fact, you can go to YouTube, Santa Rosa. There was a, a gardener who was going around looking for work, and somebody called the police. He had his gardening tools, and they slaughtered him right there. It's on YouTube. So they kill everybody, they kill black people. They kill brown people. The typical victim of police brutality is a Native American. So I mean, they don't they don't uh, make any uh, you know choose or pick and choose. They kill brown people, black people, red people. Vig the vigilantes do the work for them when they are not around. So uh, Vincent Chen, a Chinese American, was murdered because they thought he was Japanese. So I mean, this is a, a this is a, a police force all over the country has gone crazy, it's run amok, and they get away with it because the majority, not the young people, but the majority of, of people in my generation, right, white people, endorse it. Otherwise, they couldn't get away with it. For me, I think also besides just the historical legacy of all this and how long it's been happening and how many times we've had to see it, I think it's just how callous it felt seeing the video, um, yeah. seeing his knee on the chest and the hand in the pocket. I think that mm -hmm. that's something. And here in Phoenix, you know, um, with Dion Johnson, the same thing with him already shot laying on the ground bleeding out and then the officer while well, as he tries to get up kicking him so i think the callous nature of these murders and not that this brutality hasn't always been there but coupled with the cell phone footage and being able to have footage of seeing somebody dehumanize somebody so aggressively and again i just can't say it, it's just so callous like i can't even treat my dog the in public the way well, they some of these if they treat a dog like treated that, people. Arrested. If they treat a dog like that, they've been arrested on the spot. Agreed. Agreed. And so I think that's another thing to besides kind of our collective mourning of being able to watch this together as we deal with COVID and our concern with the you know economic inequalities that have been exposed because of COVID. I think there's just a lot of things to be super, super mad about. And then you see somebody with their hand in the pocket, like I just keep on going back to that image because it really rocks. We haven't watched the full video of George Lloyd, but the hand in the pocket and him crying for his mother. I think those things are the reason why so many people were willing to, you know, go to the streets and why um, it feels different and why it's worldwide, at least for people of my generation. Because again, I know that this has been happening forever and you guys have all fought these battles long before I start helping to fight. And thank y'all for that. But for me and people my age, I think that's what it is, how callous. Yeah, and I just last night, there was footage of more police brutality on the news. And um, what's interesting or scary or horrifying, however we want to put it, is that um, police know that they're being filmed and they still feel uh, sanctioned to yeah. perpetuate the violence. Like looking into 
the lens of cameras and still uh, perpetuating the violence. And so that's something that's really interesting. It speaks to, again, the idea that um, they have been able to get away with this um, for 400 years or whatever it is um, without punishment. And so that speaks to your point, Doug, about the sort of casualness Mm -hmm. of that violence um, without uh, consequence, right? You can be casual when you know that there will be no consequence uh, to you uh, murdering someone. Yeah. And I think it also came, you know, after the, you know, Amy Cooper incident in Central Park with this white woman weaponizing her white womanhood on a black man who was bird watching. It comes after years of a white supremacist president who's, mm -hmm. a, you know, fascist underpinnings of Donald Trump. And, and so, um, and, and so many other things, like, I think it's this cumulative effect of all of this. And I think that, um, you know, it was funny. I had a few, I've had several irritating phone calls since this started on a, an e emails, but um, a couple of them have said like, this is so, I feel so sad watching what's happening. And, and I was like, wait, I feel actually so inspired by this generation. And I felt so sad you know, obviously of all the things that had caused these people to come out of their houses in the middle of a pandemic. But for mm -hmm. me, it was like, they have a pulse and they are here to show us they have not given up on their futures and they are going to come together and they're going to defeat this evil in our culture. I mean, I, I felt very inspired by your generation, Doug, and the people, you know, who, who have come up, you know, under... Donald Trump and and have come up in this moment when they're supposed to be sitting, you know, sedentary in their homes and not interacting and felt such a collective empathy and rage for what had happened. Um, that was to me not sad. That was the hopeful part of it. Right. And because of them, I, I, I said earlier, too, you know, we went from, well, we'll just fire these guys to all four being brought up on uh, murder in the second degree charges because these young people and all kinds of people like Ishmael was saying earlier, all kinds of folks took to the street and demanded something different, that this was not going to happen like this again. Um, well, you know, so, yeah. so, uh, <clears throat> Donald Trump is more obvious and more crass and more blatant than the rest of them. I remember Ronald Reagan, I remember yeah. Ronald Reagan's administration. He called black people monkeys. Yeah. He called Martin Luther King a communist. And he tried to throw back or do a rear guard thing and all the progress yeah. that people had made. George yeah. Bush is looking like a saint right now. Right. I George. mean, what a I rewrite. Mean, George Bush for the first one, he ran on the Willie Horton campaign. Exactly. He was a rapist to get votes from white men in the South. And then yeah. you got his son who killed a hundred thousand people. Over 100 mm -hmm. them because the invasion, of, and he also yeah. had a nice division that like uh, did a wink and a nod, a wink and a nod to the police department and their brutality. Yeah, and I mean, I think that Trump began with Reagan, like that is the beginning of this shift in this in this country, and um, you know, from the 70s to the 80s, and we have to look at it, you know, as not uh, when Trump was elected. You know, I had so many people sort of saying this is crazy, this is insane. And I'm thinking this is actually where we've been since the Reagan administration. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. you know, there was an interruption with Carter, mm -hmm. but this is a, I agree with you completely about that. And yeah, the revisionist Ronald, history of, of George ran, Bush. Ronald Reagan ran against black people. He ran against yes. black people. Yeah. That's how he came to prominence. Yeah. Right for the and then, First of all, G. Edgar Hoover didn't want him because he's going to these parties in Hollywood and thinking about people who, whom he suspected to be communists. And then Diego Hoover said, well, maybe we can use this guy. So he helped him, helped him pave the way yeah. to the presidency running against the Black, Black Panthers. And I was teaching at the University of California in Berkeley mm -hmm. when the campus was attacked by air. It's not the first time they talk about that helicopter last week. It was attacked by air using chemicals that had been outlawed by the Geneva Convention. So we've been here before. We have, we have. Well, that reminds me too, um, 
think, I don't know, maybe it was a conversation we had a long time ago, Danzi, and I've had with a lot of other people, um, the sort of two Americas that we were living in so that when Trump was elected, so many of our white friends and family were shocked um, that he'd been elected where the rest of us folks of color had felt something percolating for years and Trump's election felt less like a surprise and more like something that had come to fruition. Um, and yeah. so, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, and I've had the, you know, sort of strange experience, um, cognitive dissonance my whole life of, of passing as white unwittingly mm -hmm. and have had this sense of the kind of gaslighting of sense of like the denial that there is rampant racism and liberal, conservative, all of these worlds that I had to be privy to, um, but then saw the sort of false front come up. So I got to see both the, the what, what people say when they think they're alone and what people say when they're in quote unquote mixed company. And, you know, that's why I was thinking, I was very interested in the cell phone because it's like, I've been aware of that, that split in, in and, and the kind of um, willful ignorance of white America to admit its own privilege and the fact that white people are walking around every single day presumed innocent. We always talk about black men being presumed, being suspected, but we, when you have a white appearance, you walk into a space and you are presumed a lot of things that are positive. You're presumed innocent, especially if you're a white female, you're presumed to be non-threatening. And so I think, you know, I, I'm really interested in how the projection is put upon black men and black women and people of color. But I'm also interested in what the sort of the Peggy McIntosh idea of the invisible backpack and people understanding that whiteness is a commodity and you were born mm -hmm. with the thing, you didn't earn it, but you're benefiting from it everywhere you go. And it's not, you aren't just gifted. <laughs> right. You know? Like <laughs> and your kids aren't just gifted. You there are other mean, things working on their on their behalf all the time. Do you know why the uh, police feel that they can get away with uh, these murders? They have something called uh, jury nullification, where even though somebody might be convicted in a city in the urban area where there are blacks and Latinos and all the uh, you know diversity of people, they take these trials to the suburbs. Yeah, Simi and, Valley. Just hold on a second. And the prosecutors demand or keep black people off the juries. That's what they did in the OJ case in Santa Monica. And that's what they did with Bill Cosby, who's 80 years old, 82 years old. They don't care about the virus affecting him. They let these guys who try to undermine democracy and the government, they let them go. So that's how they do it. Sunny Valley, the Trayvon Martin, you, you remember that case where the yeah. prosecutor, prosecutor said, that these black guys are threatening all blonde women. Did you, you didn't catch that angle, did you? Where they brought up this blonde woman whose house had been invaded, and they said, is it going to happen to all you white women on the jury? So they take it to the suburbs, like in Simi Valley, and, and in uh, the case where they killed uh, uh, Amado Diallo, they took it to Albany, Albany, New York, outside of it, and they got off. So that's why these guys feel that they can get off. They can always, and here in, in Oakland, we had something called riders. There were these cops going around, planting evidence on people, beating them up and everything. One of the guys, he escaped to Mexico. The other three, I think they got off, but they took it to a suburban jury. And a black woman on the jury said that they kept talking about Dirty Harry, that the cops had to be like Dirty Harry in the city, and they let these guys go. So that's how they do it. They get a pro what, what uh, Goldman's father called a proper jury, like the one in Santa Monica, yeah. and to erase or nullify whatever decisions came uh, came uh, down from a diverse jury. Sorry to interrupt you. No, it's Can um, I about some practical things. Because I've I've looked at television for the last two weeks, and what I see are people trying to out eloquent each other. <laughs> You know, everybody, it's like some kind of contest. There should be a, like a Jeopardy or something. For, but anyway, we got a denazification 
we have to do a denazification and a de Ku Klux Klanification of the police departments because Nazis and the Ku Klux Klan have infiltrated the police departments, like Mark Berman in the OG case, he was a Nazi, according to Johnny mm -hmm. Cox. We have, we, we have to prevent the police from taking all the drug money out of the, the, the ghettos. I mean, we could use that money to funnel back into the, uh, if, I mean, if they're gonna sell drugs, we can use that, right. police take the money, so hundred million dollars, they take it out. They shouldn't live in the neighborhoods. The police should live in the neighborhoods, no more commuting, okay? Yeah. So Ishmael, you um, you're touching on something that was part of my next question, which was to all of you. Um, can, I, can I make one more point? Sure. More point. There are four policemen who were murdered in Oakland here, and one of them we knew the guy. He was out here, you know, protecting our neighborhood. It was because of some blunder made by the police department that these guys are murdered. The police unions blamed the black mayor, who at that time was Ron Dellum. Ron Dellum goes to the funeral, which is like a white power rally, and he's insulted at the funeral. I mean, that's how it's a us against them mentality that the police have, just like in my hometown, Buffalo, where they shoved this white man, a white man. Yeah, they, I saw that. They pushed him. 50 police have resigned to support these two guys who pushed them down. So they have an us against them mentality, but there are things that we can do. We, can, we, should have, we should have black leaders, brown, others, you know, gender, whatever, have a veto over every police hire. We should have ethnic studies taught at the police academy. Gender studies, because they treat women badly. You see, you see some of this film about they beating up black women. I saw one where they knocked knocked a black woman down and you know stomped on her or whatever. They should have stuck educate these guys because these guys are the scapegoats. They have a whole criminal apparatus behind them: judges, corrupt judges, corrupt prosecutors, corrupt medical examiners. You see what the medical examiner is saying? He is saying that was a mercy killing. In so many words. He's saying that uh, Floyd had so many things wrong with him. Now they're saying he had the virus, but he had heart problems and this and that. So this is like euthanasia. Or, I don't know. But anyway, Michael Biden, one of the foremost pathologists in the country, looked at that body and said his arteries, arteries were clean and that he didn't have a lot of these conditions. So there's a corrupt medical examiner. They always lie. Yeah. So the police are these guys who, these guys in the, the murder here, they formerly worked at McDonald's. They right. I mean, the thing that's frightening about right now is like every day you're trying to see how much further it will go and this level of corruption and, you know, but Dana, were you going to ask? Something yeah. About? So, I mean, Ishmael was getting to some of what I was wanting to ask you guys, but, you know, one of my main questions is like, what do you see or what do we see as the solution to this systemic violence? And Ishmael said, we need to de Ku Klux Klan the police. Um, de Nazify, because the Nazis are there too. Or, yeah, exactly. He said that. I mean, yeah. the Germans, <laughs> Germans have done a de Nazification thing that's still going on. Right. Yeah. So right. then I guess I'm just wondering. A lot of people feel sort of like, in addition to taking to the district to the streets and demanding change, like what is it that people can do? What is it? Um, Doug, you're nodding. I'm wondering if you have thoughts about this or not. Uh, no, yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I totally do, and thank you, Dana and um, Ishmael. You're so right on all these accounts and. Again, you being there on the front lines of this for all these years, it's nothing but respect. And I'm so thankful for everything that you've done. But when I think about this and, you know, that's why I was really so excited about the protests that I was able to attend yesterday because we were calling for outside and objective oversight of the police. And that's what we wanted funding here in Phoenix. And so, you know, again, I was so disappointed that the city council tabled the vote for another day. But I think that's one of the things is that we need this outside and objective oversight for police uh, for police officers. 
I think the other thing is that we could start thinking about, you know, a criminal justice system that's not as much punitive and more, you know, about like promoting community safety and preventing crimes instead of like maintaining the order of the status quo. I think so Mm -hmm. much like, you know, the way these officers are trained are so about punishing people. And then I think a little pragmatic thing could just, you know, get this choke move out of all these police ha- uh, manuals. I think that that would be a pragmatic first step as well. So for me, I think kind of the pragmatic things are outside objective oversight and then also getting rid of this choke move ASAP. Right, right. And I mean, these are we, we fought to have the police cameras and these people just have casually turned them off. Um, so that's something that should be, you know, punishable that you, on any kind of traffic stop, anything you, you would have to have that. But I think, you know, I think it's, I, I'm, I'm all for the practical. And I think also, you know, I think people coming out and continuing, I, I keep hoping this isn't like a bonus February, a bonus black history month, and it's going right. to end just as quickly as right as that month ends. (laughs) And so I'm like, you know, I don't know, it's, it's, it's great to have all this energy, but like, we need to have sort of things that can be sustained, because you can't sustain um, being out in these, you know, huge protests, all day and all night, like people have kids, people have jobs, people, or they did have jobs, (laughs) they have school, but like, you know, that idea of like, the way the news cycle works in this country and the sort of two week window and the sort of level of interest in the subject. I mean, Dana and I were talking about that, like the level of sudden flurry of interest in race and that things that we all have been thinking and working for decades for our whole lives have not had the privilege of not thinking about. It's just interesting when there's like this intense level of sudden wokeness and you're you you I do get a little bit like suspicious of how it can be sustained and how it can be um go on to a deeper level of awareness in the culture right you do have that feeling too that not only in our writing but in these moments that sort of black folks are called on for solutions you know got to do a lot of extra (laughs) work (laughs) <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Where was everybody before? Where was everybody before? I mean, Where were they? Right. Yeah. And and people calling me and asking me how me and, and my family are doing and how are my children and stuff. I'm always like, wait a minute. I, I don't know. There's just something funny about the 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 way people are expressing their concern. Um as if it wasn't the same to be a black person last year. <laughs> I don't right. know. Like, what After, just happened? That's what I was going to right. yell. As if we weren't at risk six months ago. As if we weren't at risk two months ago. And now all the homies want to call us up and ask us if we're okay, you know? All the homies who wear different bodies. Like, we were in this precarious body even before all this happened, of course. And again, all y'all know this better than me. But I, too, have felt that suspicion and low-key anger at some of um, our white allies for now wanting to text me and see how I am. And now wanting to see how my peoples are, but not before. I totally agree with that, Danzy. It's very frustrating. Yeah. I thought that yeah. about the election as well. One of the reasons I let go of social media. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yes. Um, I don't know. You guys might not um, feel comfortable doing this, but one of the questions that we had on the list here was I was just thinking about, we're talking about this sort of intellectually, but all of us have lived race in America in a very specific way. These are, these are our lives. These are our children. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you have, I don't know, any sort of story or something that you'd want to impart personally. Again, not, it, this isn't, doesn't feel sort of comfortable for you to do that. But I mean, we live this violence day to day and we fear this violence day to day. Um, and so I don't know if you have particular stories. Danzi, you talked about passing as white and sort of how that's informed your life. Um, I don't know if you have that something, so, Doug, that you, or that Ishmael. So, that is so boring. <laughs> Isn't it boring? <laughs> I, I mean, you know, can, can I talk about uh, the bad apple thing? You know, sure. they said bad apples. There's a, a study called 
the Plain View Project, okay? Which examined the posts made by thousands of police on social media. They found that the posts representing troubling conduct in a database that is replete with racist imagery and memes, and in some cases, long vitriolic exchanges involving multiple officers. These are thousands of posts made by police of a racist nature. So where are the bad apples? They're hiding somewhere in an orchard. And then we got the San Francisco police. Text messages in which a trio of San Francisco police departments, officers, department officers, referred to minorities as barbarians, cockroaches, and other slurs that should trigger an even larger review of past criminal cases for signs of racial bias, according to the city's public defender. Uh, Attorney Adachi, who's a friend of mine, he's, I don't know whether he's murdered or not, but he was the one who uh, stood up for victims of uh, police brutality. But this is a widespread thing. I got a lot of stairs. Here's uh, The Guardian, extremist cops. Can you see that? Extremist cops. How is how you law enforcement is, excuse me, no, the letter is missing it, failing to police itself. And then we have the Washington Post. Yesterday's Ku Klux Klan members are today's police officers. Well, we, yeah, I mean, your, your point is that we're dealing with a, a they, whole system. That's, they have to be purged from the, they have to, ADL. No excuse. But you, but Ishmael, you know, you know Abu Ghraib, right? Let me make one more point. The Anti-Defamation League and the Southern Law Poverty Center knows who these people are. They can be identified. They should be purged. Okay. But what I was going to say is, you know, it's also not about those individuals, but the system that creates them as well when you look at things like I mean you can go back to the Stanford prison experiment and like right. people being put into a basement and dressed as guards and start acting fascistic towards people who are not dressed that way and you know there are people who I think what we were seeing with those um cops who shoved the 75 year old man in Buffalo one of the men tries to stop to check on him and the other cops push him and there's a kind right. of um fraternity of thugs, you know, that, that dominate the whole culture of the police. And um, yeah, of course. And I that's, that's why we're here because we under, I mean, we know and understand the history and we understand that it's systematic. And so, yeah, again, just asking how do we change this? And how, how do, do we it? make it uncomfortable for that person to, you know, behave that way even I don't care what the police officer's thinking about me or about you like I don't I need them to have checks on their behavior because they're going to be racist cops so how do we make it right. a fearful experience for them to actually enact some of this violence on the communities how do we make it uncomfortable and you know consequential for that I think well if the worst thing that happens to you after murdering someone is that you lose your job something else has to happen there so yeah. And well, that's why I think it's outside. Then they, to another town. then they go to another town. No, right. Yeah. And re rehired elsewhere. Yeah. What were you going to say, Doug? Well, that's why, again, I want to emphasize like these citizen oversight groups, I think, are very important. And I think the other thing, um, you know, to deal with this kind of systemic stuff, we need really systemic changes. You know, these problems are like, a, you know, this is a quote that everybody's been throwing around, but that, you know, Systemic problems require systemic changes. So I want to go back to the point about just even thinking about the way we really police people and like, how does the police function? Like Ishmael made the wonderful point about having the police in our own neighborhoods and not having outside police. I think there's a whole bunch of wonderful discussions happening, you know, with police and community organizations in Chicago and South Central LA, all mm -hmm. over the country of this kind of more local policing. I think that's super important. And I think also the uh, going to your point, Danzi, the body cam thing is so important here in Phoenix with that um, bike officer, bike officers aren't required to have cams. 
we all know how almost everybody who rides a motorcycle has a go cam, a GoPro. So like, why can't they just have a GoPro on there? All these kind of things to where we can have different levels of accountability and also thinking about different ways for us to even punish people, I think are the real big conversations that we need to have. And of course, these are all difficult. I mean, even with us four here, it's hard to like land somewhere, but I think that's the kind of work that needs to be happening or moving towards those kind of things. And for me, the biggest thing and why, again, I was so excited about yesterday is something like citizen out, uh, citizen oversight groups. I think that that really matters for the police right now. And like having the cam on and having citizens be able to hold the police accountable. So we see right. the video and we hold it accountable. And not also, and I think the other thing as well is like having the DAs and the lawyers working with the police, like, again, like where, you know, you're not going to be mad, at, <laughs> like you're not going to betray a police officer because you might need them to get you evidence later for you to get a slam dunk case so that when they're in cahoots, of course, you know, it's not within their um their best interest to, to uh, you know, um, go against each other. So again, I want to emphasize the outside um, objective observers of police action and make sure that we are observing them as much as possible. I think those are the two things. And like Danzy said, staying so mad. And I mean, yeah. I'm tired of being mad, but I'm so mad and so hurt. And I think those are the most important things for me. I don't want this to stop. And if you were texting me yesterday, and weren't texting me five years ago, maybe you shouldn't be texting me. I think that as well. Yeah, oh. and I think, you know, I agree with you, Ishmael. You're talking about the L.A. uprising and the Latinx um, people being out there. But I do think it's also important, you know, this term people of color has become so trendy and popular. Um, and I've I've sort of resisted that idea that we're all just people of color and there's no specificity there because I do think we all have different, each community does have a very different relationship to the police and to racist violence and our histories are very different. And I don't, I sort of resist the blending and, and I think that tends to erase the sort of specificity of the black experience in America and in the black people's community relationship well, to police. Okay. Well, millions of uh, Hispanics are black. What's up? Millions of black, millions of Hispanic people are black. I know that. So I mean, what we do is we accept a linguistic uh, designation when it comes to those people, Latino like people. They have African ancestry, Puerto Rico, Mexican. You see, so uh, I think they, they get beaten up too. They get beaten up too. But what I wanted to say was, Danzy, I think you ought to run for the National Organization of, of Women President. You know. And try really? to get, yeah, try to get white women to stop voting against their interests. Oh man, yeah. please don't give me that and job. It, yeah, in addition I, to I, your I, other I, things, Danzy. Yeah, be responsible for white women. Yeah, I'm gonna take care of all the white women. That sounds fun. Well, they need 53 percent of white women voted to Trump after all it's all the misogyny. I mean, if I as a black male, if I said some of that, boy, I, well, I am in exile as a writer because I just made some comments for fun that, you know, I guess I don't, they, people didn't get the joke. But 53% of white women voted for Trump after all his misogyny, you know what I mean? All these women, he, he's supposed to rape the 13 year old girl. That's, you know, he, this woman's afraid to come, come forth to talk about it. Two thirds of college educated, I mean, Clinton, Trump beat Clinton by 7% when it came to college educated women. So I think what, uh, women like you and other women should do was organize a freedom summer and go to the South and to these Republican areas and try to educate these people. That's your assignment. I have books to write. That's my job. Yeah. <laughs> <about> Sorry. <laughs> I do write about that. I do write about that. Speaking of books, um, <laughs> But I do, do, but I do think you're hitting on something because, Absolutely. you know, there's been a lot since the, the Amy Cooper incident about um, sort of the weaponization of white female, quote unquote, fragility and the ways that ha that has affected um, black, the relationship to the black community and the problems in second wave feminism were a lot about, you know, the the 
blind spots of, of the feminist movement in the 70s and, and beyond, and, and the sort of um, inability of, of a lot of so-called feminists, because I, my, it's not the same feminism that I hold, that where race and class are central to those um, questions of gender, like those, that, that blind spot of white um, wealthy women who have been sort of the most vocal in these movements, I think, um, historically has, has created a great, you know, divide that, um, and I'm just all for more complexity and not trying to reduce it to one identity and one um, piece of the self. But I think, you know, you're, you're saying I should be the head of this organization. Like all of us are asked to do all these second, third, fourth jobs. Um, well, I do and I think- I do second, third, fourth jobs. You've I'm got a, kids who are still I'm, young. I'm a jazz musician. <laughs> I mean, you have young children. I, got, I don't I, have time for that. I mean, yeah, <laughs> Tony Morrison had kids. He wrote a whole bunch of novels. Okay. Two very fine kids. You know? mm -hmm. So, I mean, somebody ought to run for National Organization of Women. They only get excited when a black football player is accused of rape or some stuff like uh, Ray Rice. They, get, they come out, have a press conference, then they go back to sleep. So, somebody ought to run. I might run. You think I you should? You should. I think you should do it. Yeah. Now, now let me tell you something about feminism. Oh, uh oh. Here we go. Wait, wait. What do you mean? Here we go? What do you mean by that? No, I mean, I, I mean, started it. I started it. I'm the one to blame. I brought it up. Is that, nobody should criticize it. No, I just did criticize it. I wrote a novel called Record Cyborg, and it was based on a very famous feminist comment that Emma Till, for whistling at this uh, woman, which turned out to be a lie, she said she lied, was just as guilty as the people who murdered him. I had fun with, you know, I went to town. I got run out the country. I, I, I want to, I want to, I, yeah, I, 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 you're I, talking I, about I, your writing as well, writing, and I want to ask you, let me tell you I want to ask you something more specifically about your work. Okay. Since we're talking about fiction. And that is that double edged sword of writers of color, uh, not necessarily being expected to, but sometimes being expected to. And then sometimes just because this is what we write, writing about sociopolitical issues, the, uh, that, that, that uh, job falling in our laps, but also not necessarily getting the sort of widespread recognition that other writers who aren't of color get because they're staying away from these kinds of topics. And so one of your questions early on, Ishmael, was basically why aren't there, uh, A, more stories um, by black men, more fiction out in the world? That's one question, but also the question of um, that burden of having to be sort of representational in our work and not quite getting the sort of attention and accolades because it's considered controversial. You said, Ishmael, that you were ran out of the country. Right. So I don't know. There's a lot of questions in there having to do with what we do as writers, as folks of color. Um, but either any of you could address. That's a, that's a, a, a black women too. That, I'm sorry. That applies to black women too. Uh, of course wife. it does. These people see a few black women on the bestsellers list. They think, well, this is like a, as two feminists told me, this is like, you're wrong, Ishmael. This, the black women are, are the boom, part of a boom going on. Of in course. The, the most, one of the most brilliant writers in this country, Me Day. I published her second book. She wrote a, a, a classical novel, classic novel. Couldn't get a publisher. I published her second book. You don't hear about her at all, you know? I, publish, I see a whole lot of manuscripts by women. I've published a lot of women, you know? Last five or six books I've published are written by women authors. So it's hard time for them too. I remember Elizabeth Nunez, you know her work? Yes. Under the Limbo Silence, brilliant writer, brilliant writer. She says that the uh, publishers want uh, girlfriend books, okay? So if you look at the bestsellers among black writers, you gotta go all the way down to 40, number 40 to get a decent book. Uh, Nella Larson's, uh, one of Nella Larson's books, 40, but you get all this uh, Harlequin stuff 
preceding that. So uh, it's a bad time for black women too, just because two or three are successful and we're well known because maybe they live in Manhattan or somewhere, except for, uh, for uh, Perry McMillan, who was a grassroots writer. She got her support from the grassroots. Uh, there are, you know, hundreds of excellent uh, black men and black women writing. But I want to talk about my case. My thing is to take on the establishment. I don't punch down, I punch up, see? I can't get published here. My op-ed is coming out tomorrow about this situation that's going on now in pa El Pais, a Spanish newspaper. A few weeks ago, I was published in Liberation in Paris. Before that, I was published in Haaretz in Israel. So what I learned was I have to have a global strategy because my, my opinion is hard to take in this country. So what we need is more black publishers. Hakeem Adabuti publishes some of our books, but he doesn't get, his books don't get reviewed. They don't, they don't get distributed. So, uh, you know, we have to do uh, more to uh, get ahead of uh, or combat uh, the, the uh, white nationalists in publishing. Even children's books. I read in the article in the New York Times. Even most of the people who write children's books are not black. So, it, you know, it's a struggle. And I think, um, you know, even when you do have a publisher, um, there can be expectations of your work to do certain things to comfort that wide audience and exactly. to be non-threatening. Um, my exactly. second book got completely either ignored or trashed. And one of the things that when I was trying to edit it that the publisher kept telling me was, can you make this more redemptive? And I came to hear that word redemptive as really, really loaded. And there was all Absolutely. sorts of things beneath it that were very um, fraught. And I really resisted being that redemptive author. And it speaks to like the last few weeks and we we're talking about these phone calls and these things. Um, I had a couple of people keep saying to me, you know, well, is there any hope? And I was like, can you just not start with the hope talk right now? Like, let us be angry. Let us be revealing of the problem. And, right. you know, we don't need to, uh, I, that's what I love about Nella Larson is she allowed for these really um, sort of non-redemptive endings to her work. And she, she, I think she was way ahead of her time because she just went there and she left you with the problem. She left the reader with the problem, but I don't think you're allowed to do that. If you're, I think that's really um, something you get punished for if you're a black well, writer. Yeah, and the irony of that is I would think that, you know, a lot of folks in the publishing indus industry would consider themselves liberals and woke, yeah. et cetera. And yet they're acquiring books that make money um, but it's, you know, it's a circular thing. Like perhaps more political books would make more money if they promoted our books the way they promoted these other books, right? So it's sort of a circular thing. Um, and I wanna ask you too, like there's something much more serious about the fact that some work gets published more than other kinds of work because what we're doing is it's our legacy, right? It's, we're writing about what's happening about black lives and what matter to us now and what matters to us then and what would matter to us in the future. And yet, if we don't have those books being published and out in the, in the world, I mean, it's a much more sort of serious, um, dangerous prospect thinking about who gets published and who doesn't get published because that legacy is in a fact erased. Um, yeah, yeah you, we, need more, how, we need more black editors too. We need more black yeah. in publishing. I have a mm -hmm. best story now, Malcolm and Me, about my experience with Malcolm X when I was a young person. It's a bestseller because I have a black publisher. It's on Audible, so buy, so buy it, right? So, <laughs> okay. Donzi, Donzi makes a good point, excellent point. The novel of redemption or the, the nonfiction of redemption, they got that from Baldwin. So, what you mm -hmm. have now is all these people on TV talking about this case who want to occupy Baldwin's space, or mm -hmm. Baldwin Jr., or the son of Baldwin, where Baldwin rides again. But I, because his first, the part next time was about redemption. He was saying that white people are innocent of what they're doing. He refers to them as the, the chorus of innocence. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know the pain that they're inflicting upon black people, okay? And he says he could redeem them. He's a white preacher. 
go tell, uh, you know, tell, tell me how, uh, go tell the mountain, boy preacher, evangelist. So we got all these people on TV trying to redeem people. What they forget, I taught ball in universities. What they forget is by 1968, James Baldwin was no longer redeeming people. He given up on that. Tell me how long the train's been gone. He right. brought up against his sponsors. They they do a hatchet job on him in the New York Times. He's ousted. They replace him with Eldridge Cleaver. But he said the only place is uh, Proudhammer, Neil Proudhammer, his persona in the novel, said the only place where he felt comfortable in the United States was a Chinese restaurant in San Francisco. <laughs> Doug, you were shaking your head about some of these points made about the publishing industry. I was wondering if you had more thoughts on that. Yeah, no. Um, I just always think back to the Langston Hughes uh, essay, The Negro Artist and the Racial Mountain. And I think the bind that he describes in that in 1926 is what we're still working under, you know, that um, Black uh, readers uh, want a certain kind of book from you as well, don't want you to mm -hmm. show the details of Black life. And um, I've been hearing a lot of things, and this is so true that Black Plain isn't the only thing that we have. And, I, and that's so, so true. Um, and so you have like that kind of poli policing of content on one hand, as Hughes describes, but then also from white audiences, you have a, like at Danzy and Ishmael are talking about a don't make us feel uncomfortable. Please, uncomfortable. Us, please give, please give us something, you know? And I think that dichotomy really stifles creativity. I know as a younger writer and, you know, only with one book out thinking about my second book, like I'm very much so so much more aware of all these voices than I was before, you know, and I think it's one of the things be, that's crippling our authors and the next generation's writers as well, because we have to um, be pledge allegiance to so many different uh, authorities. And I think it gets really hard to have any kind of expression in that kind of um, controlling zone. So, you know, um, trying to create out of that space has been really difficult for me. And it just kind of blows my mind, you know, reading over that article again, that that's written in 1926. And like, he could have literally yeah. that right now. And I just be like, right. yeah, yeah. Like every time mm -hmm. I like finish a poem, I can hear all these voices, like all of them all the time, you know? So no, it's definitely still working on it. And I don't have a solution for it, but I just wanted to just show how systemic it was that, you know, and I know Du Bois articulates it before that even. Um, so yeah, we've been talking about literally almost this exact same subject as candidly and as eloquently like Ishmael has been saying for almost a hundred years now. And yeah. that's, I think the rage that we all have. And again, feeling the kind of catharsis that I felt yesterday, uh, saying stuff like, uh, they've gone too far. They shot Dion Johnson in his car with a group of people is just what I needed because it's just so much, so much so much. But I will yeah. say, you know, Ishmael, your work has been so liberating. I think for so many black writers who have come after you, you were like, you know, one of the people who was just so fearless and free in your work. Um, and it, it gave the rest of us permission and gave us a kind of blueprint for doing things differently. So I think, you know, I'm sorry you're having that problem now, but your work stands in the canon as so important and essential to black writers and white writers and every kind of writer in terms of the things you were doing so ahead of your time in a way. Well, um, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Saw, after reckless eyeballing, I studied Japanese. I wrote a novel called Japanese by Spring. They didn't make, they didn't right. pull us about it here, but I got a great reception in Japan, got a trip over there, got two trips to Chinese universities. It's part of a national project, which means that the Chinese government pays for the study of this novel. Mm -hmm. And I got a couple of trips to, to uh, China. So that, so I, uh, I learned, I studied Hindi. My latest uh, novel is called Conjugating Hindi. Uh, Pakistani and Indian uh, critics like it. People here don't have a clue. So I think that you, you really have to go global. I think you, I think you yeah. have a couple of languages to get out of here, to get out of this trap, this prison. I yes. Wonder, one more thing. I was, I was on a periphery of the Black House movement. Okay. We didn't care whether you read us or not. I wrote a novel called Mumble Jumble. I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't care where you read it or not. It was like Miles Davis turned his back on the audience, you know? Yes, so now, I love that, yeah. yeah. So, so now people want to, they want readers, they want to assimilate. 
you have to write any way you want to write, any way that it satisfies you, and mm -hmm. up the audience. Exactly. Right. And I think you, Mumbo Jumbo, and all of your work, you've done that. And it's it's really um, powerful to the rest of us. So we hear it yeah. and we see we you doing it. that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I do agree too. It's like, well, I think all of us, we write what we want to write and we do what we want to do. But I would still also want people in position in these publishing houses to recognize what we do and support what we do just as much as they do other works. Um, we're not waiting for them to do anything like that. We're going to do what we do. But that is part of the problem. Well, I'll tell you what. That, you know, we don't have people in power. Doing and we it. have to write these cliches and we have to write these sort of, um, and we have to perform our blackness in a certain way that people find familiar and find comforting, even if it's angry, anger, like that, right. that, that pose is something that they might want from us. They want us to be really sad and to write a title that has the blues in it and the Bible in it and like play these roles that are sort right. of scripted. And I think anytime like, Ishmael's work, like you step outside of that, you're going to make people uncomfortable, their confusion they're going to feel with the complexity that you're putting out there. Well, you know, other people have the right to be angry. Like uh, Barbara Reynolds was fired from U.S. Today because she didn't appeal to their angry white male demographic. So, I mean, you know, some people yeah. get angry, other people are forbidden from, uh, from being angry. Yeah, exactly. So, um, one, you know, about publishing, Terry McMillan was a student of mine. She called me up and she says, uh, I want to write uh, bookstores and tell them I'm coming to town. And I said, well, no, 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 your publisher does that. The rest is history. I mean, you really have to get out of, in front. She wrote letters yeah. to bookstores, told, had book parties, told them that she's going to be in town, and she, you know, sold her books. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you guys, since we're still talking about literature and the writing world, um, how do you see, well, I guess this is a question, how can literary communities and writers specifically participate in social change? Is it explicitly through the work? Are there other avenues, ways that our, our artistry, our fiction, our poetry, our writing um, is connected to that social change? How do you see us as writers doing that? I think, you know, I keep, I'm not, I, I'm sort of laughing about you saying I should be the head of this organization because I think that you as a, uh, all of us writing, you know, fiction and poetry, like, I think you, you do have to really protect your time and to, and, and understand that implicit in your work is, is what you need to be doing. Like I, I, I resist that sort of tax that we all are supposed to pay as black writers that we are supposed to be out there being politicians and sociologists and do this other job when you are an artist and you should be creating your work and, and your work is where the truth is gonna come from. And I, I, I really feel protective of that space as an artist. Um, at the same time, it's another language that I'm participating in when I go to protests, but that doesn't feel right. like my art. That language is very different from the language sure. I'm protecting in my fiction. Do you know what I mean, um, Doug? No, Leopold Segor was a uh, Segor was a, pr a mayor, you know, and uh, Doug V. Yates was a politician, belonged to the Senate, Irish Senate, and uh, who am I thinking about? Harlem Gallery. Uh, another another writer uh, was the the mayor of a, a town in Oklahoma. Why is his name escaping me? But they made a film about him. Uh, the great debaters. All right. You know, but I, I think that's Harlem my Gallery wrote Harlem Gallery. The great debater. He organized uh, a populist movement, in the, but he was a great writer. But I think that's my job as a human being to be involved in this movement. But my job as a writer feels like that's a a different energy. And like I don't know. I'm curious to hear what Douglas and Dana. What do you feel about Melvin that? Tolson. Melvin Tolson. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. Great writer. Yeah. Melvin Tilson. Doug, what are your thoughts? Uh, for me, I, I think we all have different roles to play in this movement. And I think there's a room for everybody who wants to participate any way that they want. And I think I get a little afraid if we're going to be indicting each other and holding and saying that other people should be doing this and doing this. I think that all this is so taxing on all of us, the exhaustion. I think we all collectively feel the anger, collectively feel the way that we overwork, the way the POCs and black students are needing us and needing us to help them more than they uh, need some of their white mentors to so that they're spending that time with us as well, which we don't get to be writing and thinking during those times. So I think we're already asked to do so much more labor um, and I think that other people who, again, like the people who have been texting us all the time, asking us if we're OK, I think it's time for some of those people to start doing some of the labor. Because like Danzy said, even though, you know, yes, as humans, we all need to do a lot of things. I can't be a sociologist, an activist, a historian, a politician and a professor and a poet. I would like to be able to, but I don't think that I would be able to do all those things well. So I think just even for my own sanity that like I have to kind of bite off what I can do. And I mean, has, you know, when I worked for organizations like Acorn and Perg and stuff, um, I wasn't a writer then. And I think that, you know, just as I wouldn't tell, you know, Black Lives Matters uh, organizers how to make a protest happen, I don't want them telling me how to write my poems, you know? So my role when I was out there yesterday is I went out there and I just did what everybody told me to do, who were the leaders who were, who were right. And so that's the way I can help. But again, I don't, I think that we would maybe do ourselves a disservice and an injustice if we spread ourselves too thin and aren't the best of ourselves for the other things that we need to be being the best of ourselves for, like our families, our students, and our work. So even though I know that everybody has a role in the uh, in the revolution and in the movement, I think, again, that we need to take care of ourselves on a micro level and on a personal level as well. And I, I really take my, my lead from these young younger people right now. Like, I feel it's their world and I'm here to help them protect it and, and, you know, make, improve it. But like they, they're, they're leading me, these people. Yeah. You guys are young, young people. <laughs> I'm not that young. Those people out there, I'm talking about my students and my, uh, my children are really, to me, the ones I'm trying to, to um, follow. Cause they, they, they know things that I don't know. And they're right there. Um, oh, you guys sound so jaded. I mean, God, you just, you got a whole life. Yeah, man. we sound jaded. We're cynical, <laughs> you know. But I, I believe that all fiction and all poetry, you know, in America, like if you write a novel, you might not think it's about race, but it's it's always got race in it. And like a lot of white writers will say, you know, this work I'm doing, it's not political and I don't have race in this novel. You do have race in this novel. Absolutely. If you're writing from this in this country, you just don't know it, but it's all over your book. And, and, for me, everything I write, yeah, of course it's political. This is all Absolutely. a political statement. And being a black artist in America, being a biracial artist, like it's it, everything I write is a political piece of work. Yeah. I don't so, think I've met, I've, I can't think of anything I've written that hasn't been political. It just, mm -hmm. it is. But the there. absence of, like, you know it is, but the absence in some of the work I've read of, knowing that it is, is itself a political act. That silence, mm. that white silence. Absolutely, that yeah. only mention blackness when a black character enters, only mention race when a black yeah. character enters the room. We were supposed to understand everyone else was white was without white, them telling right. us. You know, all of those things are political statements that that I, work is making. I heard mm. a language poet uh, read a poem about a uh, South American country that's undergoing turmoil. I said, those people down there got enough problems and we, without you reading that poem. <laughs> yeah. I, so, I mean, some people can take it too far. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, um, those, people, those people run universities, language poets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, they got like a little Scientology. I, maybe I don't mean that, but it's like a cult. Yeah. And, no, uh, it you, can be. You got to be really righteous with them. In order to Whoa. Get them. Yeah, no, they'll kill you with that righteousness. And, and a feminist. I mean, Curry, leave the country. Feminist drove him out of the country. He's teaching at the University of Edinburgh now. 
What, who was that, Ishmael? Tim Curry wrote Man, oh, Man, yes. Man Not. Right. Book Award. So you got um, your things, you know, going around little cults. Well, that's where I'm saying, though, that the language of, of wokeness does not feel like it has a place in my novels. And, like, it's a certain language that is, um, I think, sometimes really helpful for political movements, but it's not the language that my work is going to be burdened with on the level of art. I don't think it's the same. Right. Well, and politically, people have less space in terms of their behavior and expectations, whereas you know, characters and actual human beings, we are messy, complicated people. Yes. And so the work, the art is the ways in which we can express those layers and nuances and complications. But sort of out in the world, there's like, you think this way, you're either with us or against us. It's, it's a very different. Well, when um, I was um, talking a lot about my first novel, Caucasia, um, I had a lot of interviewers say, well, can you tell me what the point of is? of your book. Like, what's your point? What's the point yeah. that you're trying to make? And I what's said, the, the book is the statement, the story I told. You cannot reduce a work of fiction to one moral statement, like like how to kill a work of art. So, you know, I think right. black writers, when you have black, quote unquote, black themes, whatever the hell that is, like you, yeah. you get burdened with these kinds of questions. Um, I've gone, uh, done readings in bookstores where then uh, the question and answer part of it, they ask me, um, can you explain why Obama identifies as black? Like, I'll just have some random ass question in the audience. <laughs> and I'm like, did I just read from my novel that had nothing to do with that? Like, and we're in a bookstore. So I think like that if you're on, like people who are on that level of sort of preschool level race, questions, which I think a lot of white people are at that level of like preschool. We're in kindergarten now. Like you have not thought about this until right now, last week. And I don't want to do that work. I don't want to yeah. um, go back to the preschool and well, sit would, with you in the circle and sing Kumbaya, I like would, go would, read a book. I wish that the novelists would try to advance the form instead of concentrating on questions like that. You know, the novels uh, are about 50, 50 years behind uh, painting, about a hundred years behind uh, jazz. I mean, the poets are the avant-garde writers. Right. But the novel, they all read the same way. You know, you can predict from yeah. the first page how they're going to end. But <laughs> I would argue, too, like, I agree with you, Ishmael, that they all read the same way, but that's yeah, part of the publishing, publishing industry, right? Well, the publishing yeah, exactly. industry be racist. I mean, it's, I mean, it's racist. Yeah. It's interesting. They admit it. Exactly. It's but that's the it. thing. It's like... Yeah. You know, they're all reading the same because those are the kinds of books that are being acquired. And anyone else who's doing something a little bit more ambitious or different, you know, they're having a harder time getting their work out there in the world. That is, it is what it is. That's what exactly is happening. Well, I get my books published in Montreal. So, you know. Well, <laughs> yeah, because we all got to get to Montreal. No, you got to get out of the country. Because you're always going to yeah. be, you're going to be a slave then. Yeah. And one of the things that's been most powerful to me about the last two weeks, besides just seeing all the young people come out of the pandemic <laughs> into the streets, um, is the international response to mm -hmm. the murder of George Floyd. Seeing the Syrian artist painting murals of him, seeing the people in London, and and one of the things that leaving the country and traveling has really driven home to me is that the story of black American liberation is the story that people all over the world who are oppressed look to that, that Absolutely. black people, the black American experience is a global narrative that uh, when I was in Japan, the Korean people were talking about Toni Morrison and learning about how to be proud of being Korean in Japan through black American writers. So like our struggle is, it has this power around the world that I'm, I'm really moved by. Um, yeah, there were protests in Europe, South America, Africa, the Middle East, the Asia Pacific, like people saw what was going on here with George Floyd and they took to the streets all over the world. Yeah. Um, precisely for the reasons that you say, I mean, if Americans are in denial about what's going on, other folks in other nations are not, yeah. they, see what, they see what we're seeing. It's amazing. 
Yeah. And this person um, who nobody would have ever, ever heard of otherwise, like to see that is, is powerful. Right. And again, it's because of the folks tipped to the streets, right? So mm -hmm. um, I, we are, we were supposed to go for an hour or so, and I, I don't see any other questions coming through, but I wanted to ask about perhaps to end this discussion, writers that all of you, black authors, authors of color, who are folks that you're looking to, that you're reading or rereading, that you recommend to, to everyone else who, are, who want to read such authors. Well, I'm reading Robert Coover and Victor Laval because hmm. we can be doing something different, you know, because these other novels, they're interchangeable. I'm sorry, formalistically. Yeah. See, what, I, what I've done is I, I did a graphic novel in 1972, but I continue. I went to cartoon school when I was 70, you know. My cartoons have been printed all, you know, San Francisco around a lot of places. So I illustrate my books. Hmm. So, you know, try to add another dimension to your novel. Mm -hmm. Right. In right. terms of being a black writer, I'm a black writer. I've become even more of a black writer since I've been living in the inner city for 40 years. I'm not looking at black life from Harvard or Cambridge or Georgetown. And I'm not, you don't have to have a post-colonial glossary to understand what I'm saying. Do you understand? So I see this stuff from my front porch. So I, I assert my blackness. And without blackness, my novels wouldn't be what they are. Without blackness, Invisible Man would not be what it is, even though he said it's not a black novel. So that's my point. That's all. Mm -hmm. Danzy, who are you reading? Oh my God, I'm, I'm actually not reading fiction right now either. And I don't know if it's Ishmael's influence here. <laughs> but I was just I'm reading from very- I've been in fiction too, you're right. I am reading nonfiction history. Uh, and uh, this was before this happened. I'm reading this history of this term um, that I'm very interested in called Melungians. And it's about this, um, it's the history of the quote unquote Melungian people in Virginia, which was an interracial community of people. Right. And it was so wacky and um, strange to read about now. So I'm, I'm, I'm writing a novel and I find when I write I, I like to read nonfiction actually and not take in too much fiction. So, yeah. Doug, how about uh, you? Uh, for me, I think Kiki Petrosimo's book, White Blood, A Lyric of Virginia, uh, Tiana Clark's book, I Can't Talk About the Trees Without the Blood, uh, Don Lundry Martin's book, uh, Good Stock, Strange Blood, and then, of course, Alice Joseph's uh, Confessions of a Barefaced Woman. Those are texts that I've been uh, yeah. reading right now for those and just um, kind of um, stewing in those and returning to those again and again. But I mean, I think also, you know, from Robin's book on, and Dexter's uh, Booth's book as well, Scratching the Ghost and his new book that's going to be coming out, uh, Abracab Abracadabra Sunshine, Safia's book, Cannibal's Amazing as well. Mary Give Alice. us the last names, Doug. Give oh, us the last I'm so name. Sorry. Oh, yeah, my bad, my bad. I'm acting like I'm just talking to USC people. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, there's the rest of the world. Hi, y'all. How y'all doing? Mm -hmm. uh, now, um, Dexter Booth's book, uh, Scratching the Ghost, and also Abracadabra Sunshine, Sophia Sinclair's book, uh, Cannibal, Mary Alice Daniels' book, uh, Blood for the Blood God, like, you know, just in our- uh, uh, And you department. mentioned uh, Robin Cost Lewis as well, right? Yes, Robin Cost Lewis, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. uh, a, vo a Voyage of the Sable, Venus, and other poems. Like I think uh, just at USC, all of us um, um, Black writers who are on the program have been uh, publishing very- uh, Incredible. Books, talking about the moment, are resituating the conversation. I think uh, in poetry, as we've all been saying, uh, we've kind of been the aesthetic pulse <laughs> or conscious of, of literature for a while and taking the most risks. And I think all these texts, especially Don's book, which I just yeah. adore, um, are just taking a kind of risk and, and using different meaning making strategies than have been used before. And I think I'm very excited about all those texts and those are people I'm coming to. Nice. Okay, nice. I'm amazed okay. you were able to do that. I always stumble on that question and you just did that so beautifully. <laughs> you just rattled them I, I off. Like, I'm just reading this history book, but you did a great, 
I feel, yeah. I just thought about all the peeps, you know. I love it. <laughs> Well, because like we've been talking about, I, I think, you know, similar to like, you know, when our students tell us to like, there's no good music out here or something like that. It's like, well, you're not looking hard enough. I think there's, you know, people writing really dope stuff like and doing dope things and really taking risks like all over. You just sometimes and it's unfortunate. And that's what we're talking about. That it's just not right there for you. But I think if you do a little sleuthing, like you can find people, you know, taking the risks and and. um uh, challenging the way the status quo and the way that uh, novels, poems have been told for years. And I think all that's out there. And so hopefully, you know, with us saying it, even though I know a reading list isn't going to change the world, uh, I saw an interesting article on uh, Vulture today talking about that, you know, these reading lists aren't going to save us. Like everybody's like trying to give somebody how not to be racist reading list. But at the same time, I do think, you know, when we see, um, all the different ways to be uh, that one is black in America, all the different ways that one is Latinx in America, one, all the different ways that uh, one is, you know, uh, from the Asian, Asian American community and Asian Pacific American community. I think the more voices that we let in and like get rid of all these kind of monolithic notions of like what these minoritized peoples are, I think that's when you hopefully we can create more empathy and not have somebody have their hand in their pocket while having their knee on somebody's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And look, yeah. as you said, Dana, look right into the camera with the hand in the pocket while doing so. Can I get mm -hmm. uh, Louise Merriweather? Louise Merriweather? Who's in Louise Merriweather. Weather. Louise Merriweather. The weather. Number runner. Everything that's happening now happened in the 1930s. Police brutality, the whole thing. So I wish people would read that novel. Maybe the great American novel is uh, Jubilee, Margaret, Margaret Walker. Yeah, yeah. Been through this before, Jubilee. And I want to get yes. for my magazine, Conk. We have 73 writers, original pieces from all over the world China, Japan, US, you know, Europe, Middle East, responding to the, to the uh, virus crisis. The first volume is online right now. It's Ishmael Reed, P-U-B at dot com. Ishmael Reed, P-U-B, publisher.com. So the first issue is up now. The second volume will be up next week. Okay. Okay. Um, what about you, Dana? Yeah. I mean, I'm reading, I'm rereading, and this is, Ishmael made me think of the graphic novels that I love, and um, I'm, I'm rereading, um, um, Jimmy Corrigan by Chris Ware, oh, he's not African-American, but it's one of my favorite books oh, really? ever. Yeah, mm. um, he's really smart about American history in this graphic novel and the ways in which race is a construct. Um, just very smart, beautiful, beautiful book. My son's and favorite author is Chris Ware. Is it? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, that's he yeah. loves him. Yeah, I, I've, I've read Jimmy Corgan at least ten times now. Oh my taught God. It, he has it, too. Then, oh wow! I yeah, know that. yeah. And then my other go-to book, and I'll be teaching a course uh, on this writer in the spring next year, is um, Edward P. Jones, of course, The you Known World. Him. And so he's uh, somebody that. People don't know his name and I don't know why they don't know Edward P. Jones's name and they should. And so he's someone that I always turn to, the short mm -hmm. stories and the novel. How many black slave masters were there? How I'm many, sorry. How many black slave masters were there? How many black slave masters were there? Oh, I don't know. It's a fiction, but I don't know. Because I read a book by a uh, comment about the guy that, uh, the guy that uh, did, uh, was it Forrest Gump, that movie? Mm -hmm. He's like a Confederate apologist. And he said that novel show there are most of the black, <laughs> most of the slave masters are black. Okay, wow. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Correct. I'm just, I'm just curious. I, mean, <laughs> I guess we're good for ourselves, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lordy. Well, thank you. All I think um, this is a good place for us to wrap up with these books that might be helpful, might be sustaining for folks to read. Um, thank you all out there who popped in for this discussion, and thank you, Ishmael and Doug and Danzi. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dana, for thank you, Dana, us together. Thank you, Dana.
And uh, this was a wonderful conversation. And I just, I guess all we can do is sort of go forth and continue to fight the power. Yay. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm ready for it. All right. Thank you, Goodbye. Dana. Thanks, Ishmael. Thank you, Thank you so Bye much. All. Thank you. Be well. Be well.